to my message, I want to just chat with you a little bit. I want to talk about something that uh, that all preachers go through to some extent. Uh, uh, I had an argument this week. Uh, have you ever... Now, here, here's the problem. I had an argument with God. Have you ever had an argument with God? Now, I don't mean I was... I, I didn't raise my fist or anything. I didn't say anything bad except uh, I don't think that's right or something like that maybe I sure hinted at it and uh, it had to do with what I ought to ought to preach today and if you remember three weeks ago I preached on the subject of holiness the next week I preached about uh, the matter of worldliness and then last week I preached about the fact that the work is great and so in light of all of that I thought I've got it all figured out what I'm going to preach next and uh, and all of a sudden, the Lord just uh, kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, "No, no, that's not what I what I want. Uh, I've got a I've got a different plan." I even gave the Lord three options. <laughs> I said, "Lord, I, I I wanted to preach a message about emptiness. I wanted to preach a message about what's missing." I wanted to preach a message on intimacy with God. And and I thought surely one of those at least, uh, I had them in the order I wanted them to go in, of course, but uh, he said no to all of them. And the bad thing is I didn't get my way. And the good thing is I didn't get my way. (laughs) So God had a reason. And so many times, you know, as a preacher, your mind goes here and there related to, to the great truths of the Bible. And sometimes it's not until the, until the last minute or the last day that God says, you know, I've got a different plan. And, and uh, you know, you, it, you kind of feel like saying, Lord, why didn't you tell me that the week before? Why did you wait? But as I said, God has a reason for that, and His plan's always better than our plan. So uh, I, I can. I want you to turn over to First Samuel, First Samuel chapter seventeen. Now I can honestly say this: when God impressed this message on me, I was I was so focused on this message that I did not even connect or relate this message in any way to the message I preached last week. And of course, last week I preached about, uh, about David and preached about the work is great. It's not a work for man, it's a work for God. And I honestly did not connect what I'm about to say this morning to what I said last week. And it was like a day later it dawned on me, well, I'm going to be preaching uh, about, about David or some aspect of David's life. And, uh, but that was all right because uh, I've been greatly blessed by studying the life of David. In fact, I remember some years ago I preached a series of 34 messages one year on the life of David. And uh, and could have preached more than that, but easily you can come up with 34 messages on David's life. There is absolutely so much here that it's it's unbelievable and so practical and so important. Naturally, one of the highlights is found here in chapter 17, First Samuel chapter 17, and this is where we find the story of David and Goliath. And, uh, you know, although this story is known and loved by millions of children, I want you to understand this is not just a bedtime story to entertain the kids. Uh, That's all right for that, but it's a whole lot more than that. This story relates to us important information that's beneficial to even the most mature Christian on earth because it shows us how we can be victorious when all of the odds are against us. But today I want to focus on just one phrase and one verse. But before I do, I want you to kind of bring you up to date to where our text is. I want you to notice five things quickly. 
And beginning in verse number 12, down through verse 20, and we're not going to read those verses, we see that David was faithful to the task assigned to him. David was a shepherd boy. Amen. And uh, his daddy told him, go out and take care of the sheep. That's where he was. He was doing what he should have done. Amen. His daddy told him that I want you to, uh, I want you to take uh, supplies to your, to your brothers. And David was faithful to do that. David was also, beginning in verse 23, fully aware of the problem. He knew exactly what was going on. And he wasn't going through life with his hands over his eyes and just uh, ignorant of anything. He knew what was going on. He knew what he was getting into. And then as he goes out, and there we see Israel's army, and of course there are the Philistines. And, uh, And whenever David suggests that something has to be done about this. Here's his brothers and all these others, and even Saul himself, the king, you know. Uh, and David is saying something has to be done about this. And at the moment that he insinuates that he is willing to do something, his brothers start falsely accusing him. And, uh, you know, they said, you, you just come out here to... Show off. He said, why camest down hither, verse 28, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Why are you worrying about it, dude? I mean, he, he, he's already taken care of that. And then he said, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You just want to see what's going on. Well, anytime you set out to do something for God, there's going to be those that make false accusations against you. We see also in this chapter, David was faced with what seemed to be an impossible situation. It's back in verse 4. The impossible situation is a fellow with the name of Goliath. He's about nine feet, nine inches tall. He wore a helmet of brass protected by a suit of armor that weighed 17 pounds. That's more than a shot put. Think about trying to throw a spear or do something with over 16 pounds. I mean, this guy, in in every sense of the word, is a giant. And so the question comes to to our mind, what in the world would motivate David to take on a task like this? I mean, you've got all of these seasoned warriors, these soldiers that are standing there, staring out at the enemy. Why does David think he has a chance? Or why even run the risk of losing the battle, embarrassing himself? What was it that gave him the courage that infused him with with courage? Why was he so concerned? I want you to notice the text. And David said, What have I now done? That's a question. What have I now done? Remember, his brother said, you just came out here to see what's going on. And David said, what have I now done? And here's the question in my text this morning. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And that's a question that can be applied to many areas of our life. Not just one area, but a lot of areas we can stop and ask ourselves in relation to this or to that Is there not a cause? Isn't there some reason that makes this matter important? Isn't there some reason that we ought to be concerned about it? This phrase ought to provoke much thought. Remember, it is a question. Is there not a cause? He's trying to induce them to think about what's going on. And by the way, this is something that should be considered by people of all ages. Not just those older folks. I had another message I wanted to preach. I didn't tell you about that one. And uh, now, this is what goes through the mind of a preacher during the week: the unsung heroes. And someday I'll I'll preach about that: the unsung heroes. And as I think about our church here, and I think about all of all of us older folks. And those that have stayed by the stuff over all of these years, those that have been rock-solid pillars in the church, 
Let me tell you young folks, owe a debt of gratitude to, to those people. And uh, I could just start calling them out by name, but you know who they are. And, and we are so indebted to people that are so faithful and still working hard today at doing the work of the Lord. They're doing what they can. But this is a matter that ought to be considered by everyone of every age. You might, you might be in elementary school, you know, I, I mean, you're just getting started and you need to start finding out what is important in life and what's not. You need to understand that there is a life to live and a cause to live for and something to be committed to. And by the way, this is a phrase that deserves an answer. And I say that because God expects us to know what we ought to be doing. God expects that from each and every one of us. So this morning I want you to consider this question in three ways. Number one is related to David himself. Now keep in mind, David was not out just looking for a fight. I've known preachers that uh, that's what they did. That's the way they drew a big crowd to preach to. Some years ago, at that time, probably the church, the largest church, Baptist church certainly in, in America, and I was in attendance there that day at a conference. And the pastor got up and was trying to tell all the rest of us how we ought to do it, you know, and how we can get a big crowd like this. He said, you fight against something. You let You let people know that you're standing for the truth and you're fighting against something. And boy, he rattled on a list about, uh, well, all of the things that you don't want me to talk about this morning. I'm sure every sin basically we can think of. After he covered the movies and the dancing and all of the other stuff. He said, and if you, if you don't know what to preach about, get up there and grit your teeth and preach about eating Hershey bars. They rot your teeth out. Now, he said that, I'm sure, tongue-in-cheek. But his actions, his actions proved that that was basically what he had been doing. Just do something to get in a fight to draw a big crowd. Well, David wasn't looking for a fight. He was a shepherd boy. He was happy doing that. But there was a cause that compelled him to, to get into the conflict and that gave him the courage to attempt something that seemed absolutely impossible. What is he going to do against this giant? That's the way it is, you know, with people that live for a cause. They're willing to risk failure, to risk loss, to be embarrassed by their failure. They're willing to do that, even their very lives. 1989, some of you will remember, it was on all of the news stations, of course, and all the national publication and things like that. There was posted a picture of one single man in Tiananmen Square in China. And this revolt is going on, and here's this one man standing in front of a tank. And that tank tries to get around him, tries to move, and he... Shifts his feet, staying right in front of it. Well, what is it that would cause a man in a country like that, where they don't really care anything about their people, what would cause him to do something like that? A cause. I'm not, I'm not talking about whether his cause was good or bad or anything else. I'm saying that he had a cause that he was willing to die for. And in that vein, we Christian people down through the centuries have had a cause that compelled people not only to live as they ought to, but to be willing to be different from the crowd. To accept criticism from others. And to even risk our very lives. All of those thousands upon thousands that have been martyred simply because... They took their stand for the cause of Christ. And that's exactly what we see David doing here. He is consumed by this cause 
that to him was more important than his life. But then I want you to think about this this question in a general sense. Because these words transcend the moment in which they were spoken. Over in the book of Romans, it tells us, in chapter number 15, it tells us that these things that were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning. To help us. And that question that David asked so many years ago was intended to provide instruction for us today. And so here is a question that can uh, convey a message to all generations, regardless of whether you're one of those that's over 80 or whether you're 8. There's a message in this for you because it sparks our imagination. It provokes thought. And it puts in front of us a challenge to respond to it because everybody needs a cause for which to live. I'm talking about a cause that will cause them to get up in the morning when they don't feel like it. A cause that will keep them up and keep them going throughout the day. A cause that they'll dream about at night. A cause that will spur them on in the face of adversity and enable them to sacrifice joyfully. Because they realize this cause is what really matters. Amen. When someone doesn't have a cause for which they live, they just simply are existing. That, that reduces their life to a dull, drab, boring existence. That's exactly where so many people are today. They're alive, their heart is beating, there's air in their lungs. But they have no cause, no purpose in life whatsoever. And it's so sad to think about so many that could do so much. So many who could be so much happier, so much more satisfied by just understanding that the very fact that I'm living on this earth is evidence of the fact that there is a cause for me to be here. And we might not always realize exactly what it is. But we need to accept God's Word that we're here for a reason. And there are thousands of people out here in this world all around us. Might be your neighbor, might be your relative, might be someone you never met. But they constitute a cause and are deserving of someone's attention. I I, I can't help but think about those in nursing homes. Those, you know, in extended periods of time in hospitals. Down through the years, and I think in every church except the first church I pastored, in every church in some way or another, to some extent, we had ministry in, in, in a nursing home. And one of the greatest blessings of Bev and I's life has been being with them and... Uh, And seeing the look on their face when you walk in the door. And hearing the things that they say. Well, let me tell you, somebody says, well, boy, I just want to really serve God, but I don't know what to do. Oh, there, listen, there are thousands of things that, that you can do. Just use your imagination and try to picture yourself in the place of someone in that situation. And then, of course, there could be a jail ministry. Sometimes we just write those folks off. Well, you know, they they deserve what they got. Yeah, sure they do. And if I got everything I deserved, they wouldn't just put me in prison, they'd put me under the prison. In some way or another, we got this mindset, well, they're in prison, they did something horribly wrong, so does that mean we just write them off of the list like their soul doesn't matter to God? I'll never forget a little red-headed girl that we brought to church and boy, Bev fell in love with this little girl and she come from a really poor, bad, bad family situation. Bev even... Uh, 
ask if she could go home with us one week and she gave her a bath and fixed her hair, washed her hair and, and everything. I mean, they were, they were so close to her. And then we get the news that she's been molested by her daddy. And at that time in my life, the hardest, vi- the hardest visit I think I ever made was going down to the jail saying, I, I want to visit with prisoner so-and-so. And I did. And I didn't go in there talking about the situation. Everybody knew the situation. He was in jail for that. But I did my best trying to get him to see his need of Christ. I, I'm just, I bring that up simply to say, folks, listen, there are people all around us that constitute a cause for which we ought to live. You say, well, I, I can't do anything like that. I, I understand. I remember I was preaching over in Kaufman, Texas. Had a young man there in, in the church that uh, was blind and, and couldn't, couldn't see. After a certain message that I preached, he went home and he got the phone book and some way, whether his mother was assisting him, if I remember right, she was partially blind or something. But he began to just go through the phone book. And I, like I say, I don't know whether it was by Braille in a certain phone book for that, but he began to call in people. And he said, you know, I can't, I can't go do these things, but he called the people he didn't even know. Just, hi, I'm from so-and-so church and I'd like to invite you to church. But there was a cause and I'll never forget him coming back to church and sharing that because he was so excited that God was helping him do something. Teddy Roosevelt said, No man is worth his salt who is not ready to risk his body, to risk his well-being, to risk his life in a great cause. Now, we see how it relates to David when we see in a general sense how it relates, should relate to everyone, but I want to close this morning by you and I thinking about how it relates to us personally. In churches across America right now at this moment, There are people that are listening to sermons and they do so every week. Their church attendance is spot on. They wouldn't dare miss a service. They're so very faithful and thank God for that. But they attend church and they listen to the messages and are even appreciative of the messages that they hear, but they never apply what they hear to themselves. You know, it's one thing to study the Bible. It's another thing to study the Bible and then, and then act on what we learn from the Bible. Whether we're teaching others or whether it relates to some change we need to make in our life or whatever. Anytime that we hear the Word of God, we ought to be ready to respond to the truth that's, be, that's coming from the Word of God. And that's why he said in Romans 15, this is for you. This is not just, you know... Family history for David. This is for you. This is for me. There is a cause. Now when it comes to our cause, we have to look at it from a different perspective than the world in general. You know, you can ask some kid, you know, what do you want to be whenever you grow up? And he's able to say anything. I want to be a ball player. Whatever. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a. I want to be a soldier when I grow up, or whatever it is. But you and I, as Christians, we don't actually have that option to just pick and choose whatever we want, because we have to take into consideration what God wants for our life. And whenever we begin to understand the cause for which we live, God's cause, God's purpose, God's intent for us. All of a sudden, we look at everything else from a different perspective. It changes our view on absolutely everything. 
whether it's politics, whether it's the economy, or whatever it is, we think about things in a different way than the rest of the world because we're looking at things from the standpoint of what God expects of us. So God didn't leave the cause for you to decide. That's already been prescribed for us here in the Word of God. We could sum it all up by saying that our primary purpose is to glorify God by exalting the Lord Jesus Christ and as Christ Himself glorified the Father, you and I are to do the same. That's what it means to live for the cause of Christ, that we do what He did. And He Himself pointed out that, Father, I have glorified Your name. And He sends us into the world to do exactly the same thing. Whenever you look at it from that perspective, glorifying God, that pertains to everything we do. Whether it's at school, on the job, in the neighborhood, wherever it is. Our response to the difficult things of life should be a response that will bring honor and glory to God. God's cause is something that should compel us to serve Him in some way. By that I mean doing our very best to do what we believe God wants us to do. It ought to inspire us to a life of holiness. It ought to motivate us to be faithful. It ought to cause us to resist temptation because there's always something there trying to drag us away from that cause that God established for us. Distractions. Satan will use absolutely anything just as he tried to tempt the Lord. He did tempt the Lord as it were there on the mount. And the Lord answered each time by quoting as it were from the Word of God. And if we're living for a cause that that we consider to be the most important thing in all of the world, we will resist temptation and we will avoid those distractions. We'll even conquer fear. Fear is not an easy thing to overcome. In fact, sometimes it can be impossible on our own. There are folks that maybe, you know, they think, well, I've always, you know, folks have been blessed with a really great singing voice and they're just afraid to, to get up and try. They're afraid of what people would think. You doing that would kind of be like David saying, going out there and saying to his brothers, hey guys, here's your lunch. I don't think I'm going to hang around here. I'm I'm going back to the sheep somewhere. I'll climb upon a tree and I'll watch the fight. I'll even cheer you on. David said no. Is there not a cause? And notice he didn't lecture them. Is there not a cause? And then turn around and say, you ought to be out there doing something about it. Even though he would have been justified in saying those very words. But is there not a cause? Remember, they have accused him of just trying to get attention. And that cause that David is speaking about something is something that caused him, enabled him to conquer fear. And if you really are serious about serving God and willing to do whatever God wants you to do, if the cause is important enough, you'll do it. You say, well, preacher, I... You know, I, 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 want, I want to sing, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I'm afraid what people might think about it. Don't worry about what they think. Think about what God thinks. Amen. Amen. That's what really counts. Amen. Is there not a cause? And realizing, understanding what that cause is will enable us to overcome that criticism and those fault finders. And even when we suffer an injustice of some kind, 
We won't, we're not going to quit on God because of that. The cause is more important than that. Having celebrated our anniversary last, last Sunday, I can't help but think about how this relates to that because the church, the Lord's church, is involved in the greatest cause on the face of the earth. And we dare not let anything get in the way. Anything that would stop us. Anything that would get us off course. And it happens so easy that sometimes we don't even realize it. Because we still carry our Bible and still read our Bible and still give our tithe and we still do this and we still do that. And yet on a personal level, we've gotten our life off course. Instead of doing what God wants us to do, we're doing what we want to do or, or we're doing what others expect us to do. Let me just leave you with these thoughts. The cause of Christ should be so important to us. It ought to cause us to be separated from the world in our living. I don't mean a holier-than-thou attitude where you hold them at arm's length. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about being separated from their sinful activities. Well, to be sincere in our love for one another. The cause is more important. Well, to be silent in our complaining Serious about our witnessing. Steadfast in our serving. I mentioned, I mentioned these older folks a while ago that have been here all down through many, many years now. I can remember, I can remember those that were here whenever I came 35 years ago. And I can remember those that have come in 20 years ago or whatever. People that have played such an important part in this church ministry. And I'll guarantee you that each and every one of them at some point in time, there's been in a time of discouragement or whatever, that they've entertained the thought at least for a moment or two, why don't I just quit? Why don't I just throw up my hand and I'm just going to give up. It's just not worth it. I'm just not accomplishing anything Anyhow, so I might as well just throw in the towel. Don't ever say that that couldn't happen to you. Don't be too judgmental of those that have been there, done that. But I'm telling you, whenever we keep the cause before us, even though we go through those times of discouragement, disappointment, depression, that cause will keep us steadfast in our service for the Lord. And listen, we are either committed to the cause of Christ or our life is off course. By the way, when your life gets off course, you're in a dangerous area. If you're driving down the road and you get off course, you you can end up killing yourself or someone else. You can't just go anywhere you want to go. There's a highway that that's for restricted use. And you can't just see a lake out there somewhere and think, well, oh, I think I'll just shoot straight over there. No, it doesn't work that way. You gotta take the proper course to get there safe. It's that way in life, folks. We don't have any right to just go through life wandering aimlessly, not knowing anything about what we ought to be doing. If you're here today, and it might be that there was a time when you were so faithful to God, but some way or another, you didn't plan it that way, but some way or another, you got off course. Wouldn't this be a good day for you to say in your heart, I know there is a cause. I know what God's cause, God's purpose, God's plan is for me. In some way or another, I got off course. And I want to get back on course today. You don't have to say anything to me, but you might be a good thing if you'd just come and get on your knees and say, Lord, here am I.
I am so sorry for my unfaithfulness. So sorry, Lord, that I let something else crowd you out of my life. You might be surprised how that would have an effect on somebody else. That right now is exactly where, where you are. And just seeing your concern about God's calls for your life could give them the courage to deal with it. If you're here today, and maybe you say, well, preacher, I don't don't even understand all this stuff you're talking about. I'm not even a Christian. Somebody just dragged me here. Somewhere or another I got here. I wish I wasn't. I'd rather be somewhere else. I'm not really concerned about... uh, Anything you've been talking about. Would you be concerned if you knew what God really wanted for your life? Probably not. But you ought to listen. There is a cause. You ought to be concerned enough about yourself and your family. Your children. Oh, so many times people make decisions. Marriages are torn apart without ever considering the effect on the kids. You better think about it. And the only way you'll ever get your life on course is for God to have His way. You say, well, what does that mean for me? I'm not a Christian. It means this, that God's not willing that any... That would include you, right? Right? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all, that would include you, right? That all come to repentance. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood on the cross and He died for everyone. That includes you. All of the suffering and the agony and the pain that He went through, that was all for you. Had you been the only sinful person in this world, Jesus would have paid that price for you. You don't need to worry about trying to be some big success in the world that will attract people's attention. No, no. I tell you what, if you get this right, everything else, it will help you get everything else right. You get your life back on track and serve God like He wants you to. Would you do that this morning? We're going to stand together and extend this invitation. Father, we pray that You'll challenge us with the truth that we find in Your Word. That, Lord, that we'll really stop and think about those words that David spoke so many years ago. That challenge to others. Let that be a challenge to us. Is there not a cause? And since there is a cause, how dare we waste our life on all of the frivolous things of this world that has no eternal value. Things that someday we'll leave behind. God, may we this morning renew our commitment to You. Help us to be steadfast, always abounding in Your work. Because You promised it would not be in vain. And Father, for that man, woman, some boy or girl that's here today, and they've never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I could, I could preach all day long if I was physically able, and I could never, ever convince them. But what I can't do, the Spirit of God can do. And I pray Your Holy Spirit will just move on their heart this morning and speak to them in a way that, that I can't or no one else can. And convince them of their sinfulness and their need of salvation. And convince them that Jesus is the answer. That they might trust Him as their Lord and Savior this very morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While we stand in this, we sing. If God's speaking to your heart, would you come this morning?
Some of you decided that many long years